I now hand the conference over to Mr. Radesh Welling, Managing Director of Naveen Florin International Limited. Thank you, and over to you, Mr. Welling. Thank you. Good morning, and a very warm welcome to all the participants. I'm joined by our CFO, Mr. Ketan Sablok, and Strategic Growth Advisors, our Investor Relations Advisors. I hope everyone got an opportunity to go through our financial results and investor presentation, which has been uploaded on the stock exchange as well as on our company's website. At the outset, I would like to wish and pray that you and your loved ones are safe and well. We continue to follow various protocols at all our manufacturing sites and the corporate office to prioritize and safeguard the health, safety, and well being of all our employees. All our sites are currently fully functional and we have successfully completed vaccination programs for our site employees. Now let me start with key highlights for the quarter ended June 2021, followed by business segment wise updates, and then Ketan will take you through financial highlights. For Q1 FY22, our company has delivered an operating revenue of 314 crores with a growth of 53% on Y on Y basis operating EBITDA of 78 crores, which translates to growth of 50% YOI basis, and operating profit before tax of 67 crores, which grew by 59% on a year-on-year basis. All of our business segments stored, uh, showed good growth compared to Q1 of FY21, although it's on a very lower base, which we, due to, primarily due to nationwide lockdown we saw in Q1 FY21. Work on a new HPP project is going well, and we expect planned commissioning to happen in Q4 FY22. Work on our multipurpose plant in the Hague is also progressing well. Our high value businesses have seen good performance growth of 52% to 200 crore for, for Q1 FY22 compared to same period last year. It now contributes 64% of the total revenue for the reporting quarter. Our specialty business reported growth of 37% on YNY basis, to rupees 133 crore for Q1 FY22 compared to the same period last year. On Q1 Q basis, it was marginally up by 1%. The business witnessed good growth driven by mix of new products and market share gain, which primarily happened in the U.S. for one of our large products. During this quarter, we continue to strengthen our pipeline of new products and are seeing strong demand for our capabilities from agrochemicals and other industrial segments. Our cramps business has reported revenue growth of 98% to 67 crore for Q1 FY22, compared to same period last year. However, on q on q basis, it was down 11%, primarily due to moving of one order from June to July. We are seeing good traction among our existing customers and good flow of repeat orders. We continue to focus on expanding product project pipeline and further diversifying our customer base. In this regard, we have added a few new exciting customers in this quarter. Revenue of our legacy business is refcast and inorganic grew by 55% on Y and Y basis, 214 crore for Q1 FY22, as compared to same period last year, and it contributed 36% of the total revenue for the reporting quarter. Our inorganic fluoride business was up 98% on Y and Y basis for Q1 FY22 to 56 crores, compared to same period last year, and on Q1 Q basis it was lower by about 6%. The segment has seen a good demand traction from our existing end user industries of stainless steel and glass. Our efforts of widening our end user segment have been fruitful, and to that extent, export in this business has shown growth driven by addition of new customers, new international customers. Our ref gas business was up 28% in Q1 FY22 on YOI basis to 59 crore compared to the same period last year. On Q on Q basis, it was marginally up by 1%. It 
improvement in the trade and service sectors despite covid related restrictions and good volume traction from international markets are contributing to this segment growth however the prices in international markets were bit subdued and this impacted overall margins sales into non emissive applications have been steady this quarter that is from my side i will now hand over to ketan to give you a brief on the financial performance of the company over to you ketan thank you radesh and a very good morning to all the participants i start off by hope all of you and your families are in good health so i'll share the highlights of our performance for the quarter and following which we'll be happy to respond to your query so for q1 fy22 uh, the performance uh, on a stand alone basis uh, the company has reported a growth of 53% in net revenues from operation of rupees 314 crores in q1 against uh, 205 crores in q1 fy21 so as mentioned by adesh earlier the, the strong growth was also a factor of uh, lower performance in uh, quarter 1 fy21 due to nationwide lockdown restrictions in the base quarter operating a bit tower was up by 50% to 78 crores for q1 fy22 as against 52 crores in q1 fy21 the operating ebitda margin stood at 25% during the quarter margins were marginally impacted due to rise in uh, raw material cost uh, some pricing pressures and uh, also on on due to the high employee cost uh, during this quarter as uh, the annual increments uh, and some uh, bonuses were paid out during this quarter and uh, the addition of new employees uh, during the course of last year other income for q1 fy22 is rupees uh, 7.6 crores it was 35.6 crores in q1 fy21 uh, the q1 fy21 included uh, 26.2 crores of interest uh, income due to income tax refund so that was the larger item uh, in the last quarter operating pbt grew by 59% to 67 crores for q1 fy22 as against uh, 42 crores in q1 fy21 the operating pbt margin stood at 21% in q1 fy22 profit after tax stood at rupees 56 crores for q1 fy22 as against 52 crores in q1 fy21 the pat margin was at 18% Uh, quickly on the unit wise uh, performance for the quarter the high value business grew by 52% and the legacy business grew by 55% uh, during this quarter specialty business uh, grew by 37% to rupees 133 crores and cram segment grew by 98% to rupees 67 crores the legacy business showed an upward trend with a growth of about 97% to 56 crores in inorganic uh chlorides and about 28% uh that is to 59 crores in the in the refrigerant gas business yoy basis so that's all from my side i think uh, we can now open the floor for q and a thank you very much thank you very much we will now begin the question and answer session anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and 1 on the touchstone telephone If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press a star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking questions. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. The first question is from the line of Sudarshan Padmanad from Sundaram Mutual Fund. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you for taking my question and congrats on good performance on the uh, you know high performance side so my question is to you know understand you had mentioned that in cramps you are seeing good uh, you know inquiries from you know customers in europe and us so some color with respect to the nature of these customers i'm trying to understand whether they are large innovators smaller biotech i mean what is the kind of project that we are looking at whether it is early stage development i mean some color on this uh, and you know was this also some kind of a follow through from manchester because that is what we have been talking about as well that kind of uh, you know getting a lot of input from manchester and migrating those projects to india as well so some color on this would be helpful. sure 
<clears throat> so uh, if you look at uh, you know the overall growth that we are seeing and i'm talking when i talk about growth i'm basically you know including the inquiries etc in that in trans they basically kind of three, there are three uh, different kinds of growth one uh, the projects which are very nicely scaling up and we've actually been working very closely with the customers to ensure that we continue to service these businesses as they scale up. So that we are actually seeing a pretty good traction because of which you know, we see continue to see pretty good repeat orders. Uh, we've actually, specifically in this quarter, we've actually added some new customers. These are mid-size biopharma companies, primarily from US. Some of these companies we have been actually looking to target for uh, almost last two years, and we finally now managed to crack it in this particular quarter. And that would really help us going forward. These customers are primarily US-based, and these are mid-sized uh, biopharma companies. And we believe that as we grow, and as the engagement with these companies grow, uh, the, the business will be extremely good for a kind of a mid-sized company like Nazim Kumari. And the third is, which is what we are primarily seeing in Europe, we have some long-lasting relationships in Europe with some of the large innovators. So there we have actually seen the good flow of uh, new inquiries coming in from existing customers. So those are you know, uh, three different categories of inquiries uh, that we are uh, seeing, which, which will then translate into the growth uh, in terms of sales for our cram business. I hope that was helpful. Uh, yes, sir. definitely helpful. Sir, my second question is a little bit more strategic. I mean, today, if you look at it, I think we have done a phenomenal job, you know, on the cram side and specialty chemicals. I mean, largely the agro and the pharma side, across bio and, you know, the chemicals as well. But if I look at, you know, uh, uh, fluorine and such has got a lot more application, I mean, across, uh, you know, uh, in other chemicals, across automobiles, so many other sectors. You have earlier mentioned that, you know, we are working on several things on the project level on the R&D side. My question is, you know, today when we are looking at this CapEx that, you know, is expected to come, I mean, next year or later this year, I mean, that uh, multi-specialty plant, would that accommodate the newer projects or the newer applications that we are talking about? Or this newer application would primarily be for the current set of products that we are developing and we would announce another round of probably capex for the newer applications, uh, you know, on the product phase. Sure. So if you look at the two capexes that we have announced, one is related to HPP and one related to MPP. If you look at the MPP investment, it's primarily related to existing applications, primarily agrochemical and some pharma pieces there. As far as HPP is concerned, it's, it's all new applications. Primarily, these are new applications to us, to India, etc. So those those are you know focused on new applications. But I think the applications that you are specifically referring to, like EV, etc., those are not part of these existing capexes. Those are the opportunities that we are currently working on at the incubation stage. One of the things that you will see is that there has been a significant increase in the employee cost, as Ketan had mentioned, due to new addition of employees. So we've really strengthened our uh, technology base. You know, we have continuously been doing that. So we've added a lot of people on the technology and design side, as well as on the R&D side, to develop these opportunities. Because there, it's not only about synthesis. It's not only about developing a new process for an existing product, but completely developing a new product and then, then once we develop that product, to basically uh, ensure that, that that product actually has the right functionality for the end application segment. To a certain extent, this entire piece is kind of new uh, for uh, a company like us. So, you know, we are investing a lot of uh, uh, efforts and, uh, uh, you know, time on, on these opportunities. Uh, and those, uh, you know, will translate into CapEx, we believe, in the next, let's say, you know, uh, maybe 18 months or so. Uh, but in the near term, if you were to look at the next 12 months, some of the capexes which we might uh, announce would still continue to be in the traditional application because those uh, uh, those opportunities are slightly uh, farther away 
to commercialization or at least to conclusion of the business case than some of these other opportunities in newer segments. There, we are trying to get better understanding on the functionality, uh, also get a better understanding on the channel to market. Sure. So thanks a lot. One final question from my side is, as you mentioned that about hiring, can you throw some color with respect to, you know, the R&D, I mean, kind of hires that we have done, what is the kind of infrastructure addition that we have done, etc.? So when you look at the technology uh, piece, our first priority was to add more people on the technology transfer side, uh, on the design side and the engineering side, which is we, over the last one year, if you see, we have added, I mean, we have actually almost created a new function from ground up. We today have, you know, about 80 people in, in that function, which actually didn't, didn't even exist. And there we have actually got a lot of uh, investment that we have done in our pilot facility. A lot of process, you know, investment has gone into setting up a process safety lab, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then the next, and the, the reason why we did that is because our R&D capabilities was relatively strong even before. So we said that let's get this technology piece done uh, very well because you know for some of the projects that we are discussing, the basic technology has been developed by some of our international partners. And our responsibility would be to ensure to ensure uh, proper successful absorption and and scale up. So for that we needed a strong technology and design team. Now having done that, now we have started hiring for uh, R and D, and we are actually looking at some opportunities for setting up a completely different application development lab there. So we are currently in the process of evaluating the location for that. Should, you know whether it should be in Bombay, uh, in Surat, or in the Hills. So that's going to be more on the application side. Thanks a lot, sir. I joined up with you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Abhiji Takela from IIFL Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, good morning, Radeshji. Good morning, Ketanji. Uh, thanks a lot for taking my question. Uh, first, uh, just a question on the uh, you know margins, mainly. Uh, so last quarter, uh, fourth quarter, we had learned that a couple of high margin shipments had been deferred by about one quarter. And that's why the margins had been a little bit, uh, you know, subdued last quarter. Uh, so just wanted to check, uh, number one, have those been delivered this quarter? And uh, number two, if so, you know, what's the reason for some further uh, pressure seemingly on the EBITDA margin front? Um, uh, yeah, and uh, the increase in employee cost also, uh, you know, is this... Uh, a sustainable number that we should expect going forward into the year. Yeah, so I will, uh, you know, answer three questions that you have basically asked. One is, is specifically with respect to some of these orders in Q4. The second question was related to overall gross margin for this quarter, and third was the EBITDA margin. So I'll, I'll give you the response, and then Ketan can add subtract to that. So uh, the business that we had talked about was primarily in specialty. So there were two orders. So both those orders actually got delivered in this particular quarter. In this uh, specific quarter, the margins, uh, especially if you look at the uh, contribution margin uh, for the same period last year, were uh, down slightly primarily for three reasons. One, uh, in ref gas, uh, our sales uh, you know, as a percentage of total sales in the domestic market went down further, and as you know, this is significantly higher margin business. At the same time, our sales into the international market actually went up, which is a significantly lower uh, contribution margin business. So that there, you know, the shift uh, in the customer base uh, impacted our uh, margin in red cash. Uh, in speciality, there were two uh, reasons uh, why the margins got slightly impacted. One, uh, it, it's basically because of one critical RM for one of our main products, uh, uh, you know, saw a significant price escalation uh, in this quarter. And we believe that this will continue at least for another quarter or so. So there, uh, for the end, product, the, the end product that we manufacture using this particular raw material, primarily goes into U.S. customers. There are two large U.S. customers that we have. And both these are actually locked into multi-year agreement, multi-year price agreement. So, but we have actually gone back to both the customers and asked for price revision 
uh, to absorb this uh, increase in the cost. Both the customers in principle have agreed for that. One of them we should be able to implement uh, you know, in, in Q2, uh, by end of Q2, beginning of Q3 itself. Another customer, though they have agreed to that in principle, they have requested us uh, to implement this from beginning of the next calendar year, that is from January uh, 2022 which means uh, for our, as far as when you look at our shipment, it will be Q3 shipment onwards. Because they have, on the basis of our agreements, have back-to-back -back contract with their customers, so which they will not be able to change at this point in time. So they have requested if you know, we could actually continue. So that, that, that dialogue is currently going on. And the second, there is one uh, important product that we were actually supplying into pharma application, where uh, we've actually seen uh, uh, you know, significant uh, reduction in the demand, primarily driven by uh, inventory built up in the end market. So this is a product which was actually going to multiple customers within the Indian market, who were then converting into the final product and supplying it uh, globally. And there we have actually seen a sudden decrease, which even our customers were not anticipating. And this is primarily uh, because of the inventory build up. Again, here we believe that overall the demand remains uh, quite robust for this end molecule. Uh, and uh, we should again start seeing a demand come back for us from Q3 of this financial uh, year, because again, there the contracts are primarily made for calendar year. So those were primarily the three reasons why we saw the uh, gross margin getting impacted. On uh, the EBITDA piece, uh, which is primarily related to co fixed cost or employee cost, there were three reasons. One is the new employee addition, uh, primarily on the technical side. The second one was the retention bonuses that we gave to some of our critical people given our growth plan. It was very important for us to uh, ensure that certain set of people we continue to uh, keep with us. So there were certain uh, retention bonuses, one-time retention bonuses, which were paid out in this particular uh, quarter. Also, in recognition of the efforts made by our team in the last year, especially given the COVID-related challenges, etc., uh, we've actually uh, given out generous variable payouts. So you know that also got reflected in this particular quarter. And the fourth piece, which actually came in, is you know for a large section of our employees there is a kind of a double increment which happened in this particular quarter because last year we had actually deferred the increment. We did not take the increment from Q1 onwards. So, you know, the, there was an increment for FY21 and then the increment that just happened for FY22. So there was a kind of a double increment that happened in this particular quarter. So point number two, three, and four are one-time occurrences. But the point number one, which is a new employee addition, which is something that we will continue to see for the rest of the year, but the other three are one-time occurrences. Got it. Thank you. That's uh, really helpful. Um, just uh, one quick thing on that was, if it's possible to quantify the one-time portion, that will be really uh, helpful. Uh, so if Ketan G is it's possible to help on that. And the second thing, uh, last question from my end before I sign off is, uh, with regard to the new capex uh, or new project announcement plans which we were kind of considering last quarter as well but which were deferred due to covid so any further uh, progress on that and when we could expect some announcements thank you so much yeah so uh, the first point related to uh, you know the employee cost if you look at the employee cost employee and benefit employee benefit expenses have gone up by about 9 crore and about one third of that is basically because of the new employee addition, which will continue. And approximately about uh, two third, I would say 40%, 60%, 40% is because of new employee addition, and 60% is since one time, which will actually not happen uh, going forward. Uh, and I'm, I'm sorry, I was not able to hear your second question properly. What, which project were we mentioning? I was just saying in terms of the new CapEx uh, or new project announcement plans, which we had, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in specialty chemicals or refrigerants or any other areas uh, for FY22. So any further progress along that? Uh, and when could we expect some announcements on that front? Uh, yeah, so as we have maintained, you know, we've actually working on some really good, exciting opportunities. But it will be very difficult for us to give uh, a timeline because, you know, once the operating team is confident about the business case, then uh, that is where we go to the board. 
and post approval from the board is when we will be able to make the announcement our efforts are currently underway to make these happen within this financial year so you know uh, for both refrigerant gas as well as uh, specialty but it's very very difficult for uh, me to give you the timeline because it's first of all it's subject to uh, you know the operating team being satisfied with the strength of the business case and then uh, the board uh, actually approving uh, these capexes but at least from our side the effort would be to do this within this financial year got it thank you so much and wish you all the best thank you thank you the next question is from the line of ankur perewal from access capital please go ahead yeah hi sir uh, thanks for the opportunity uh, sir first question on the uh, the manchester side you know for your earlier uh, you know highlighted the synergies and the benefits that we could see uh, especially on the spec game side uh, so if you can please share your thoughts there uh so currently if you look at mol mol really does not play much role on the spec game side it primarily uh plays a role on the uh tram side uh, however we are actually trying to understand if we could really develop a kind of an integrated business model where we pan across these two businesses so we've actually working currently with a large global consulting firm to relook at our crams plus specialty pharma uh strategy and as a subset of that trying to understand how could mol help us drive the growth in this particular piece uh and that that work is currently uh, going on so but currently if you look at it mol is actually playing pretty insignificant role uh, as far as the growth in specialty business is concerned it's primarily focused on cram uh, side even there uh, you know Uh, what we used to see earlier is that the opportunities that we develop in MOL uh, used to, you know, get scaled up uh, very nicely in in uh, in in India. So that process has a little bit slowed down, primarily also because the overall inquiry flow into MOL has slowed down over the next twelve uh, last over the last twelve months, primarily because of COVID-related restrictions in UK. UK has been, you know. Uh, unfortunately not been operating the way uh, our facilities in india have been operating so we are just relooking at that entire business model to understand what do we really need to do to kick start that mol piece and how we can really develop that integrated business model which spans the pharma piece within uh, cramp as well as the pharma piece that we have within the uh, specialty Sure, sir. Uh, that's helpful. <clears throat> but, uh, secondly, you know, uh, in, in your commentary as well as in the PPT, we did mention, uh, you know, pretty healthy outlook there for uh, both specialty chemical and crams. Uh, you know, addition of new products, new clients. Uh, but just wondering, you know, from a from a capacity creation perspective, uh, you know, are we there, you know, in time, or uh, you know, will we uh, we need to ramp up new capacity addition to address the rising opportunity? where i'm coming from is that you know while the opportunities are there and probably you know we we have the capabilities there as well uh, but is there a possibility of a mismatch there in terms of timing uh, our capacity as well as the opportunity or you believe uh, there is a sufficient gap and a sufficient buffer there yeah so i would uh, answer this question in in three i mean i would have three responses to this question so one what we are trying to do as this the incubation of some of these opportunities we continue to make it happen in surat so for example in this quarter there were new two new molecules that we actually manufactured and supplied out of surat of course this is at a at an initial stage of the opportunity the second piece is if you look at the mpp that we have invested in there is a room for us to add as i had mentioned when we did the capex to add another line fairly quickly so and also the products that we had initially planned for uh npp those are expected to scale up and hopefully in in 
let's say two to three year time post commissioning of MPP will actually go into their own dedicated plans. So as that happens, we are ready up new set of opportunities which we can then put into those MPPs. And the third piece is that uh, when you set up a new plan, typically it takes anywhere between 18 to 24 months. But if you look at this 18 to 24 months, primarily the time is required for OSBL, you know, which is basically uh, you know, the, the infrastructure that you set up, the road, the ETP, et cetera, et cetera. But now we've uh, actually already investing in that in the age and we've actually uh, uh, you know, investing more than what we had earlier anticipated in OSBL in the age in anticipation of some of these newer opportunities coming in. So when we actually have to set up specific dedicated plans for some of these other uh, opportunities, specifically in specialty uh, chemical, we could bring those plants up uh, fairly quickly. You know, so it, we won't necessarily take the, uh, the period of 18 to 20 months to bring those new plants up. Sure, sir. Uh, that's helpful. And just one comment on the on the crime side as well, uh, because you know, uh, being the CGNP, uh, you know, uh, led operations there. Uh, how much time does it take there, and any plans of expansion? <coughs> Yeah, so currently we are working on the bottlenecking of uh, our CGMP3 facility because of some of these opportunities which are scaling up or where we have visibility from the customer in terms of what these opportunities could scale to in the next, let's say, two to three years. Our immediate priority is to de do the de bottlenecking in our CGMP3 plan. And that's something that we intend to take to the board uh, in the next quarter or so. And that would be an investment that would be made first. Post that, uh, you know, we would actually start looking at, uh, uh, you know, possibility of get doing the CGMP4, given, given the pipeline, etc. But that work will happen post our design uh, and the business case is ready for this de bottlenecking and it's approved by the board. So that's our phase one priority. The de bottlenecking should happen within, you know, less than six months. <clears throat> and the CGMP4, we believe, would probably take about 12 to 15 months as and when that, uh, <clears throat> that uh, CAPEX is ready. And post the CAPEX approval, it will take us about 12 to 15 months. Sure, sir. That's very helpful. Thank you and all the best. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Before we take the next question, in order that the management is able to address questions from all participants in the conference, we request participants to please limit their questions to two per participant. Should you have a follow-up question, we request you to rejoin the queue. Now, the next question is from the line of Vihang from Oxbow Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, sir. Thanks a lot for taking my question. Um, just wanted to know, I think one of your competitors domestically announced some expansions in uh, fluorochemicals, which are uh, which have like PV applications, PVDF and LIPF6. So just wanted your thoughts on if you would at any point in the future consider getting into these, and if not, then why? Uh, yeah, that's it from my side. Thank you. Yeah, so... Uh... We are looking at these products and some other products beyond these. Uh, but I think uh, we at least believe that it's very, very important because here it is not about, as I mentioned earlier, uh, about see, typically if you look at most of the fine chemical companies in India, you know, most of the specialty chemical companies in India typically are in the fine chemical stage. And there, the business model always has been to first focus on the synthesis, then you focus on the scale-up, then you focus on the design and then the engineering of the plant. In a lot of these molecules, the focus has to be on A, the functionality, the, you know, to ensure that the product has the right functionality for the right application. And the second piece is the channel to market. Because if you don't do that, you will continue to operate at a commodity end of, of that value chain. 
So we want to ensure that answer all these questions uh, before we decide which of these molecules you should go into uh, and, and how should that play really look like. So to your question, are these opportunities we are looking at? The answer is yes. But we are approaching it slightly differently. And we believe that, uh, 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 you know, once we have the right business model for these opportunities, we will then translate those uh, into uh, the CapEx plan and, and the business case. Because we believe that it's very critical <clears throat> that here we not only answer what, in terms of what products, etc., but how, you know, in terms of how that play really should be so that we can focus on operating at the top end of the value chain and don't get relegated to the uh, bottom end of the value chain. If you look at a lot of the Chinese players in this particular space are at the bottom end, the commodity end of the value chain, which is not something that we would like to play in. So that is something that we are currently in the process of evaluating. Right, right. Thank you so much, sir. That's it from my side. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Rohit Nagraj from MK Global. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, good morning, sir, and uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, sir, the first question is on the uh, CRAM segment. So you have given a positive outlook plus two inquiries from the U.S. as well as the Europe. European customers. Uh, in terms of the U.S. customers, how much is the gestation period from uh, we start uh, discussions and then commercialization of the product? And uh, typically, what is the uh, threshold uh, revenue potential from a molecule or from a project that we look at? Thank you. Uh, I don't think there is a standard response to that, you know, because it, it completely depends on uh, the specific opportunity. It depends on what that molecule is, uh, at what stage the molecule is in. In some cases, we have seen that the phase two revenue actually can be bigger than uh, phase three revenue for some of the molecules. Uh, you know, so uh, I, I don't think there is a standard response that we can give uh, to this question. It, it completely depends. Uh, it, it, Customers to customer, it varies. Molecule to molecule, it varies. Therapeutic area to therapeutic area, it varies. Uh, right, uh, fair enough. Uh, so the second question uh, is in terms of the exports market. So given that the logistics issue that are you know, currently going on in the international market, are we also facing any kind of challenges because of the same, both uh, for our exports as well as imports of raw material? And how are we trying to mitigate those challenges? Thank you. Yeah, so uh, past at least six months, you know, it's not more than a year since the COVID started, we've had several challenges on both inbound as well as outbound. Uh, logistics and the challenges uh, are primarily being on front of a the uncertainty because a lot of uh, you know vessels getting delayed or bypassing India or uh, unavailability of the containers etc etc We seem to have lost the line for Mr. Welling. Participants, please stay connected while we reconnect the line for Mr. Welling. We have the line for Mr. Welling reconnected. Over to you, sir. My apologies. I got disconnected. I, I'm not sure exactly at what point it got disconnected. So you are answering about the uh, logistic challenges from past six months. Yeah, so uh, as I said, you know, we've actually faced challenges both on the inbound side as well as outbound side. And the challenges have been with respect to uncertainty because vessels actually bypassing India or unavailability of the containers, etc., as well as on the cost escalation. Uh, also, in some of the cases for some of our raw materials, we have also seen uh, some challenges because of the issues on them, because two of our critical raw materials are mined raw materials. So we've actually seen challenges uh, on, on the mining side as well. In fact, for one of the raw materials where I mentioned that there has been a significant price escalation, there one of the large mines in, in the world actually closed down because of some labor issues, and we believe that 
later in the year the operations will uh, uh, you know restart and and uh, smoothen specifically on the logistics side uh, in terms of inbound we continue to work uh, with our uh, suppliers we also ensure that for some of these critical raw materials we really looked at the inventory level etc so that there is no uh, stock out and we have been managing that piece extremely well on the outbound piece you know we've actually because of that we've actually you know seen some delays in in the shipment where the shipments have actually kind of moved from um, let's say a particular month to another month etc but we have by and large been managing that uh, quite well and the focus has primarily been on on uh, good coordination and execution on the pricing front uh, fortunately for a lot of our large businesses where we have multi year agreements uh, these are all fob uh, contracts where there is a uh, cost pass through for the freight so we have not really directly impacted or the impact will uh, basically get negated with a certain lag having said that there are some models where uh, you know uh, the uh, the logistics cost or or the freight has actually impacted where we are actually engaging with the customer because they are actually not only facing the issues with us they are also facing the challenges from some of their other suppliers and and wherever possible we we are trying to uh, trying our best to uh, uh, increase the uh, increase the prices accordingly so when i say wherever possible uh, the customers have in principle in most of the cases have completely agreed it is based, it based on their uh, capability to increase their prices this is their contract but generally we have seen our customers Uh, in the in the true spirit of partnerships have been extremely helpful uh, in terms of accommodating our requests thanks a lot sir this is very helpful and best of luck thank you thank you before we take the next question a reminder to participants to please limit your questions to two per participant the next question is from the line of sanjay jain from icic securities please go ahead good afternoon uh, radesh sir and uh, ketan bhai uh, first question on the order book for the crams uh, in our annual report we have said that in fy21 we entered with a very strong order book for the crams which has uh, helped us to uh, scale the revenue uh, how does it stand for fy22 how does the fy22 look like for the crams and a related question we said that one of the uh the uh, project got delayed to uh the second quarter how large was that project uh, can you quantify this too uh, yeah and i yeah. got one uh, bookkeeping question just one bookkeeping question on the other expenses which have increased sharply on a yoy basis to so quarter on quarter basis it has been quite stable uh, is there any one off in that particular line item because we generally see that from q4 to q1 Uh, that cost generally tips down uh, is there any reason for it being steady quarter on quarter this year yeah these are my two questions uh, thank you sir sure so uh, as far as the open order book position you know we actually went into fy21 with very strong open order book position versus the previous year which then translated into extremely strong growth in fy21 over the previous year and as i mentioned uh, in my earlier commentaries for fy22 the most important priority for us in this particular year was to ensure that we hit a certain run rate every quarter because earlier if you remember in crams what we have seen is that sales tend to be extremely lumpy and you know of course it's understood that quarter to quarter there will be certain up and down but there used to be a significant uh, variation Uh, year on year in terms of uh, our our sales so this year our primary focus was to ensure that we take care of that lumpiness to the extent possible so that uh, you know we we don't see a significant degrowth after a year of a significant growth so yes we entered this year also with a pretty strong order book and more than order book with inquiry flow for us order when you talk about order book it it means uh pos in hand so these are you know orders where we actually have the purchase order but this particular year not only our uh, you know order book was strong uh, but also we had lot of inquiries uh, which were there in the pipeline as i mentioned lot of new relationships that we had developed etc which we believe over the next uh, few quarters would actually get translated into 
the order book. But if you look at the delta between the order book that we saw FY21 getting into FY21 versus the previous year, because that delta was big because of the in, in terms of percentage, we didn't see a similar percentage increase in, in as we went into FY22. But on an absolute basis, it, it still remains strong. The second uh, question was related to uh, that one particular order which moved from Q1 to Q2 that primarily uh, moved because uh, there was a slight delay in, in the execution of the order. And uh, that uh, this one was uh, to the tune of about uh, five point something crore rupees. <clears throat> Uh, the third question that you asked was related to other uh, expenses. So there is one particular item which is a standout item, and I'll let Ketan explain the you know the other items, which is basically related to the maintenance cost. Uh, you know, last quarter, uh, or sorry, first quarter last year, uh, we had ensured that we uh, uh, you know keep a very close tab on maintenance cost and. Uh, wherever possible to actually delay it from Q1 to Q2 or to Q3, because if you remember last year, Q1 was really, you know, the, the numbers were really depressed, as well as, you know, we, we actually didn't have almost three weeks of operation, you know, one week in March and then two weeks in April. So given that scenario, uh, we had ensured that our maintenance cost uh, in Q1 of FY21, uh, uh, Q1 of uh, FY21 uh, was uh, on the lower side. So one of the items where we see uh, increase in Q1 this year versus Q1 last year is the maintenance expense. Ketan, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Ali. Hi, Sanjay. So on your other point uh, between uh, uh, the expenses for Q4 and uh, the current quarter whether there is a one-off so as uh, radesh earlier talked about so we've been working with one of uh, you know these large uh, global consultancy company for you know uh, developing cramps uh, strategy so th they, that expense uh, part of that uh, expense has come in uh, this quarter so that's the only one of uh, uh, that we can say is, is is the added expense for this quarter. Otherwise, uh, the expenses are in line with uh, with the quarter four of last year. Got it, sir. Uh, thanks, Ketan. But just one follow-up question on this cramps revenue recognition. Have you made any change in that? No, no, sir. Yes. we our, our uh, revenue recognition for all businesses, including cramps, has been consistent. Got it, got it. Uh, thank you and uh, uh, best wishes to you. Thank you, thanks. Thank you. Before we take the next question, we request participants to please limit your questions to one per participant. The next question is from the line of Noshad Chaudhary from Systematics. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, uh, just wanted a clarity on uh, last quarter we had mentioned that we had initiated some uh, cost improvement uh, initiatives in especially in our cramps division uh, for for the new project so just wanted to understand the magnitude of this and uh, when can we uh, see the benefit of this uh, um, yeah i'll limit myself to one question yeah. No, so uh, as far as this cost improvement initiative, this is not something which is a one-time exercise. This is an ongoing exercise that we continue to do in all the businesses. Uh, this specific comment was uh, in response to a question where the question that was asked, uh, the question was asked wherein, uh, you know, what if we see a decrease in the price as the opportunities scale up? So there I had actually mentioned that, yes, uh, we expect that as the opportunities scale up, the price that we have to offer to the customer will have to go down. But our continuous focus is to ensure that as the opportunities scale up for all the repeat orders, we continue to look, at, identify and deliver these cost improvement opportunities so that our margins remain intact. So that is an ongoing exercise. It's not a one-time exercise. And that is not limited to cramps, but it's also limited to... Uh, other businesses because as you can imagine as the molecules scale up even in the specialty we then start getting uh, competition in and it starts impacting the price 
but while doing while the prices go down our focus has always been to ensure that the margins continue to remain the same and that primarily happens because of this cost improvement initiative and that's what i'll come back in now thank you the next question is from the line of nitin agarwal from bam capital please go ahead Hi, thanks for taking my question. Sir, on the Grams business, uh, when you look at your pipeline, uh, I mean, how do you, uh, I mean, how do you sort of characterize it? In the sense, do you, is there a way to characterize it in terms of uh, number of molecules where you are doing commercial scale manufacturing, number of products which are there in late phase three or in early phase three? I mean, is there a way you can help us dimension the uh, the pipeline uh, or size? Yeah. So for us, uh, we actually divide this into almost like a three into three, three by three. uh and again this is a kind of an evolving uh, metrics i mean you know there's there's not a lot of sophistication that has been applied at this point in time so one is on the basis of region second is on the basis of uh, uh, the qualification of the customer so there are certain set of customers that we call internally call key accounts so you know how much of the business is coming from key account versus you know other set of customers and again that categorization also keeps evolving as as we move along and the third piece is uh, repeat orders versus first time orders so these are the three metrics that we uh, qualify our uh, pipeline against okay as so i you don't analyze it more particularly around uh, number of products uh, which can probably get into commercial scale because uh, typical experience has been that when molecules go into commercial scale is when the volumes really take off uh as a products like these project how many such projects would we have like these which can probably get into commercialization now over the next in a couple of years so uh see we try to use the criteria that we believe we have influence over okay if, if there is a criteria that we have very limited influence over uh, it's very difficult for us to or uh, you know it, it is to a certain extent it is meaningless it's what we believe so let's assume that we have a repeat order so our focus is to ensure that we really focus on uh, this cost optimization piece that we discussed earlier on the quality of the execution and the quality of the engagement with the customer so that as the molecules scale up we continue to be the main supplier for the molecule now would that molecule commercialize or not is not something which is in our hands despite the customer giving us all the indication it's quite possible that it might eventually not get commercialized for something related in some cases things are not even in our customers hands so so that so that is the reason so we have some indication on how many of these uh, uh, molecules that we currently qualify as repeat orders would eventually get commercialized and by when etc and on the basis of that we make some of these plans that i spoke about earlier in terms of a cgmp3 b bottle making or the designing of uh, you know cgmp4 etc but we don't look at that as a critical criteria uh, primarily because it's not necessarily in our influence right thank you that's all thank you the next question is from the line of rohan gupta from edelweiss please go ahead So hi sir, good morning and thanks for the opportunity. Uh, sir, it's just a clarification of what you have just mentioned uh, in uh, earlier participant question that some of your products where the price increases has been taken with the customers which will be affected from uh, Q2 and uh, Q3 of this year, uh, while uh, the raw materials cost has already gone up. So I just wanted to understand this pressure on margins, on especially on these contracts, may continue. Or you also have uh, you know, backed up raw material prices on the old prices, so there may not be any impact on the margin. So you can give some clarification on that. Yeah, so this effect we are actually seeing for some of the products in specialty. So this is not something which is across the board. So you know that is something which needs to be remembered. Uh, you know, remember. The second point is uh, we believe. that at least for the rest of this year and when i talk about year i'm primarily talking about calendar year because for a lot of these large rms our contracts actually or our uh, 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 discussions with our supplier actually run on calendar year basis we believe that we will continue to see the pressure for the remaining of the calendar year 
Now, as far as our discussion with our customers are concerned, related to increase in the product price, we believe that the customers will start, uh, uh, you know, will be in a position to start absorbing those increases from beginning of the next calendar year, which is January onwards. Which means product that we manufacture and supply from Q3 onwards. So we believe that the pressure will continue in Q2 from Q3 onwards. The pressure will start uh, moderating. Beyond that, uh, you know, if, if we start seeing uh, some moderation in the RM prices, then the same process will actually reverse. You know, we will not immediately pass on uh, the benefit to the customer, uh, but you know, with a lag, we will we will also start uh, delivering that uh, benefit. So I think the same process that we are seeing here, where there's a lag of about two to three quarters. The same one will happen in the reverse way as the as the prices then start moderating. So, in what kind of order portfolio of your specialty cancers, the prices are fixed on annual basis, and how frequent uh, and in what portion is on a monthly or a quarterly context? So, as we uh, have indicated, I mean, if you look at approximate split that we have in the business in specialty, is about 40, 40, 20, 40 in agro. 40% agro, 40% pharma, 20% industrial. 20% industrial is mostly multi-year contracts. 40% uh, pharma is mostly spot. Most of it is like spot or maximum for a quarter. And uh, in agrochemical, that 40% which is in agro, uh, about half of that is uh, multi-year contract, and half of it is either you know uh, on a spot basis or or let's say you know quarter two quarter or you know uh, for annual contract. But uh, half of that agro is a multi-year contract, and uh, the entire industrial piece is on a multi-year contract. So it's your 20% industrial and almost half of your agro which is getting impacted right now. Which is approximately 40% of our total speciality which is getting impacted here. Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And just to just to clarify on that particular point, that 20% agro, uh, the half of that agro that I mentioned, where there is a multi-year contract, not all of it is getting impacted by RM. Huh? The RM piece is primarily impacting that 20% industrial. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Amar Moria from Alpha Accurate. Please go ahead. Hi. Hi, Ravish. Thanks a lot for the opportunity. Uh, so my first question is, uh, you know, on the few projects uh, which we indicated you know, kind of a little smaller than HPP, but we were pursuing and got delayed from the COVID. So any light on that? And secondly, one Korean contract which we had won. So have we started supplying uh, something, some products to them? So to your first point, I don't think there is any project which has, you're talking about new project or you're talking about project execution, which has got delayed because of COVID. So new projects, basically new orders, I mean, where we were pitching to few clients and we indicated that, you know, few of those uh, got delayed because we were not able to meet them personally. And these were pretty sizable orders. No. So we don't uh, believe that uh, any of those I mean, the discussion actually tends to be a little slower, but I don't think the projects as such have got uh, delayed significantly because of COVID, because we have been managing it pretty effectively on the phone, etc. Of course, you know, uh, what could possibly would have happened in one meeting takes, you know, number of phone calls and typically something which would happen in one week typically gets dragged into three weeks or four weeks. That's just the nature of the beast right now. But it's not like there are projects which have got delayed by one year or, or uh, two quarters or et cetera because, you know, because of COVID-related travel restrictions. So that's one. Uh, 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 so, uh, you know, uh, the point that I had earlier mentioned is that there could be some delay in our uh, HPP planned commission. So there also we had earlier, you know, when, when we went into March, April, and when we uh, started seeing a lot of these issues with respect to manpower availability, oxygen availability, etc., we thought that there could be delay of uh, at least a quarter in, in the planned commissioning, but we've actually been able to actually bring that up uh, further and, and you know, more or less that, that planned commissioning should 
probably you know uh, not get delayed by more than a month or or so okay uh, and what was the second question sorry you know secondly you know the one new customer which we had one in korea and we were expecting it can be a big customer over a period of time so wondering that you know two new molecules which we supplied in specialty is that related to the korean plan, korean customer no so those are not related to korean customer there are as a matter of fact there are two customers that we have uh, in korea one is for that industrial segment in specialty uh so there uh, you know it's, it's, uh, again you know as you know customers in korea japan etc take a little longer uh, to start the business and the second we had actually indicated was in the inorganic uh, fluoride business where you know it was primarily supply of uh, dhf uh, to uh, this customer in korea so that business is actually going on so there's still uh, uh, you know in the process of uh, so initially we had actually supplied material for qualification that has gone off successfully and they have actually started ordering some material from us but it is not really happening at a material uh, level yet it will probably take you know it's typical of uh, the customers in, in in this particular region where they typically tend to be little slow uh, growing the relationship but once it is it's grown it, it typically remains very very sticky okay so one last if i can uh so last question on the cramp side uh the production process improvement which we did uh, in the cramps largely from the batch reduction and all so does those benefits started uh, coming to the pnl or we are yet to see I that think i i think i already responded to that question okay so i think you said that you know those are the periodic thing that wanted to understand like you know that was a pretty uh, significant improvement in the overall batch process and improvement so those benefits started coming to the pnl or not so so as i mentioned to you i mean as i mentioned in uh, there was a earlier question also asked on this is a regular occurrence so if you look at these repeat orders that we we are getting if we had not done this the margins would have got depressed significantly you know because as the molecule scales up from gram level to kg level to ton level there is a significant decrease in the price that happens and as that happens if you are not able to improve your cost through some of the initiatives that you talked about and there are a number of other initiatives as well your margins will get significantly depressed so this is an ongoing exercise and a lot of that exercise gets translated into the cost which is which then gets translated into the contribution margin uh, on the pnl uh, thank you thanks a lot thank you that's all thank you thank you next question is from the line of kaushal shah from danki securities please go ahead uh, sir you mentioned about the uh, Uh, debottlenecking in cramps and we are already doing a debottlenecking on the spectrum side so just wanted to get a little sense as to what could be the uh, increase in our quarterly run rate uh, you know post this uh, debottlenecking no so as far as the specialty is concerned uh, if you look at the commentary that we had made earlier you know about uh, let's say two years back or or we had very clearly indicated that on the capacity on the specialty chemical side we are pretty much tapped out and lot of now new businesses which will be coming uh, in surat especially we will be able to execute on the basis of relatively smaller debottlenecking projects that we will be doing and right. uh, similarly we have been doing these uh, smaller debottlenecking projects in surat and which is then getting translated into uh, the increase in the sales that you have actually seen over the last two years in specialty if we had not done those de bottlenecking exercises we would have had to wait for this new npt investment to come up in bh to start showing growth so that's on the specialty chemical side in, on the uh, cramps uh, on the cramp side in, we uh, in this particular quarter as i mentioned to you we should be finalizing the plan but the idea is that at least on a volume metric basis we should be able to so there are two things in this debottlenecking right one is to get additional capacity on a volume metric basis so we believe that we should be able to get approximately about 15 to 20% additional capacity through this debottlenecking at least okay exact number we will know once the entire work is completed the second one is right sizing you know because we have slightly better visibility on these products now than we had when we had designed the cgmp3 we know exactly which are the processes or which are the blocks 
which will need to be further scaled up. So one is getting additional volumetric capacity. Second is ensuring that we have the right sizing of the equipment and 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 the the blocks, uh, the production blocks that we have in the existing plant. So both those efforts are currently underway. I, I believe that uh, uh, not in, in the next quarter or so, uh, we should be able to give you a slightly better response on on both on the investment side in terms of how much the investment will entail and uh, what would that translate into in terms of uh, both volumetric and value. Great. Right. That, that helps. Thank you. Thank you very much. Due to time constraints, we'll have to take that as the last question. I would now like to hand the conference back to the management team for closing comments. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. These are uh, challenging times and some uncertainties continue due to pandemic. But we continue to see very good quality opportunities that will help us grow our business profitably and sustainably over the next few years. We have built a very strong business foundation, including a strong team of capable and experienced people. And this, I believe, will continue to differentiate us. I would like to thank everyone for joining on the call. I hope we have been able to respond to your queries adequately. For any further information, request you to get in touch with SGA our investor relations advisors. Please take care, stay safe, and enjoy the festivals in the coming months. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. On behalf of Naveen Florine International, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us, ladies and gentlemen. You may now disconnect your lines.